stay for a little bit, and that's actually a really good thing. Because here in sunny San Diego, the animals are used to the sunshine. So when clouds come by, you start to see some really interesting animal behaviors. Now in order to make the lives of our animals here as best as possible, we do what's called enriched experiences. And that's going to help them to foster those natural instincts, habits, and behaviors. And we all know that animals are have a really amazing connection to nature. And we really want to respect and honor that. So when the climate is changing, when we see clouds or rain in the forecast, we start to give them clues that the if weather is going to be changing, there's going to be well, new things like for them to find. Like so sometimes after the rain, there's going to be some new food in their habitats, things for them to explore and discover. You can get a really great example of that here on our right. This is the monkey swamp, where you can find Allen swamp monkeys and the spot nose Gwenins. And I noticed they got lots of ropes and trees. That's because their whole habitat is a form of an enriched experience. Even down to the river that goes around the swamp. That's there because Allen swamp monkeys are the only monkeys that fish. So from time to time we'll put fish in that pond. It's going to help them to practice those fishing skills. Now this is called Lower Parkway. It goes right through the center of the zoo. If you look to your right, you're going to see a red circle with the number 15. That's a map marker. It lets you know where you are when you're looking at your map. That's right next to the Asian Passage for snow leopards and red pandas. And here on our right, we have the African Marsh. You can find our flock of flamingos over here. The brightly colored pink ones are the American flamingos that are native to the Caribbean. The lighter colored ones are the greater flamingos from Africa. We got a lot of cool birds in this part of the zoo. If you look over to your right, you're going to find the Eagle Trail. And actually, you see that bird with the beautiful white and black feathers? That is the Andean condor on the right side. And that's the largest bird of prey in the world. So we're getting a really cool view of that right now. You can also find animals like the harpy eagle up there. We can look down here at the African marsh. We're passing by kangaroo stop number two here on our left. This is where the kangaroo bus can pick you up throughout the day. It'll have a yellow sign in the bus window. There are four stops where you can hop on and off throughout the day. They're all marked on your maps with yellow kangaroos on your map. And I'm going to point them all out as we pass them by today. Pass by each stop about every 15 minutes. So if you just miss one, don't worry. There'll be another one right behind it. If you like to make your way up to the Eagle Trail, take the trail going up the hill on your right. It'll also take you to the Asian Passage for the red pandas and snow leopards. It can connect you to the African savanna. It'll be all along the right side of this hill. And we're going to catch a glimpse of Highway 163 on our left. And that's going to take you to our other front door, the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. We're all a part of the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And through our alliance, we're able to reach wildlife all across the planet, helping them wherever they may live. We're going to get a good example of that on our right here in the African savanna. We have Brevi zebras. Now, they are the largest of the zebra species. You can find them living with the giant elands. And next door to them, we got Sphinx gazelles and the lesser kudu. Now, on the left side of our bus, we have the northern frontier. That's going to be home to animals from the Arctic, like reindeer and polar bears. And the best way to see the polar bears is to go inside that dark tunnel on your left. That's going to take you down into the polar bear plunge. We're going to see if we can catch a glimpse of those beautiful bears from our bus here on the left side. We have three bears that live in our zoo. Their names are Kalut, Shinti, and Shinnuk. And they're all incredibly important because they help us learn more about polar bears each and every day. It seems like they are just out of view. They're probably on the other side of their home. When you go down into the polar bear plunge, you can get a really good view of them. You can get underneath the water, see them swimming. Right around noon, we have our polar bear tops. Actually throw some, man, uh, some fish into the pool for them. You can actually see them eating later today. All right, well, we're gonna keep moving up the hillside, check out some more animals we can see well. If you're a big fan of polar bears, just keep looking out to your left. You might see them as we drive up. On your right, you can find the Bondabox. They are one of the most endangered animals of Africa. At their lowest, there was just 17 of them left on the planet. 
thanks to one farmer that got them all together, their species was able to make an incredible comeback. There's actually a Bondabok baby who lives out here. It's laying down right behind this tree on the right. When you come back and look for it, it's going to have the smallest little horns. They live right next door to the Garagooks. Get their name from that large neck. Their name literally means giraffe neck. It's going to reach high up into the trees, getting those tender leaves other animals can't get to. At the top of our hill, you're going to find Sky Flurry West. You hop on board here, it'll fly you back to the front of the zoo, dropping you off in Discovery Outpost. Now you can hop on the Sky Flurry, uh, Sky Flurry all day long. It is just a one-way trip each way. And that should be running until the zoo closes today, which is going to be 5 o'clock. Oh, we got a great view of our mountain lions on our left. Check that out. So we got Sierra and Taco that live up here. This is one of the perks of coming to the zoo on a cloudy day. The mountain lions are out earlier than usual. Now on the other side of that cliff, there's a whole canyon where we have more animals. Um, so she's actually keeping an eye on those animals. She can smell them, probably hear them. And they can see her and hear her as well. Now that's a form of enrichment for both of those species because it's going to help to practice those natural behaviors, right? She's going to be stalking them, trying to hunt, keeping an eye on them. And the other prey animals are going to be moving around, being attentive, listening and looking for our mountain lions. If you'd like to get off your feet for a little bit, the 4D Theater is a great option. We have shows going on about every 15 minutes. You can purchase tickets right at the theater. Then you can make your way over and see if you can catch a glimpse of the main wolves. Now, I'm not seeing them right away, but I'm smelling them. If you smell that musky, skunky smell, that comes from them. That's how they mark their territory. They usually live towards the back of the habitat behind the grasses. When you come back here later, look for red fur. They kind of look like giant foxes, but they aren't foxes, they aren't wolves, they're their own distinct species. And they live right next to kangaroo stop number three, which is right next to the entrance of Elephant Odyssey, which we're about to explore. And we got a pollinator garden here on our left where we're growing native plants for our native pollinators, animals like bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. They're really important because they are responsible for about 70% of the food that we eat. So if they disappear, we'll be disappearing soon after that. We can be allies for them by gardening for wildlife. If you plant native plants from wherever you're from, you can have a whole ecosystem in your home, helping out those butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. Now if you look up to the trees on our left, you're going to find the rock hyraxes. These fuzzy little critters are actually the closest living relatives of elephants and manatees. It doesn't make a lot of sense at first glance, but when you look a little deeper, it starts to make sense. We know they're related thanks to their skull shape, also the big foot pads they have in their feet just like the elephants, and they got tiny little tusks right at the front of their mouths. And here we have our lions. We got Curtis and Miss Ellen. They are brother and sister. And they were both born at the Safari Park. And now they're our little lion pride here at the zoo. Now these lions are known as crepuscular animals. So that means they're active right around dawn and dusk. They like those twilight hours. They spend most of the day sleeping. They can sleep for up to 22 hours a day. But it's incredibly important for their health. It's what helps them to store energy, so when they need to go out hunting, they have a high chance of being successful. Miss uh, Ellen, the sister, who's laying over on the right, she'd be the one out hunting. In earnest, he's going to stay at home and take care of the cubs. If you have little ones with you, you know just how much energy that can take up. So it's really important for them to get that rest. But you'll see them waking up throughout the day. You might even hear them roar a little later. You can actually hear that sound all the way in the parking lot. Now we're going to let our vehicle pass us by so we can take our time exploring. The lions are unique because they are social animals. They live in those big families known as prides. But we're about to come up to a big cat that's a solitary hunter. Now this big cat you can find across South America. And we're about to see if we can spot her. Take a look over to your right. Look for Nigiri, our jaguar. 
that she is the most dangerous animal here at our zoo. She is the smallest of the big cats, but she has the strongest bite force. Good job, crackle bit turtle shells. It pierced the hard oh scales of crocodiles so and cadets. As she used to live in the Americas, the last sighting of jaguars in North America was in the 70s around Palm Springs. Since then, they've moved further down south into the Amazon rainforest in South and Central America. And we're working very hard to help protect the jaguar and people in South America by using camera traps to keep track of their movements, seeing where they're living, so we can make sure to keep people and jaguars out of each other's way so they all coexist and stay safe. Across from the jaguar, we got our elephants. And the rope of one of ours, I think that was one of our Asian elephants. We have five elephants to live at our zoo, and we have four homes for them. Each one's built a little differently, to give them variety in their day, something new to explore and discover. Now, here we got one of our African elephants. It's gonna be one of our boys. Yes, I believe that is Nepo. You might find him living with Sun Tzu, who is our other African male elephant. If you see two elephants living together, and they both have tusks, so those will be the boys. If you see an elephant with only one tusk, that's going to be uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, they're actually the youngest elephants here. They're 12 and 11 years old. We used to consider ourselves an elephant retirement home. With the new addition of our boys, we're hoping to start our own little bachelor herd here. This building on our right is called the Elephant Care Center. Every day elephants get daily checkups, and it looks like some care is in action, so I'm gonna be quiet as we drive by. You guys take a look, and I'll talk to you about what we see after. one of our Asian female elephants in the care center. I don't know if you noticed, but at one point our care specialist pointed their finger up and then that elephant raised her trunk up. That's a great way that we're able to examine their mouths, look at their tiny little tusk inside, make sure that they're healthy. All the animals that live at our zoo have choice and control. So every day they got to make choices and have control over their daily lives. They get to choose where they spend their time. The care center is a positive place for them. There's always food there. So they go in there willingly, on your 15,000 pounds, you're not going to move unless you want to. Now, these beautiful birds on our right are called the secretary birds. They are native to sub-Saharan Africa and actually lived on our planet for thousands of years. It's kind of hard to see right now because they're laying down, but they have very long legs. They're actually raptors, just like hawks and eagles. But they can fly, but they hunt on the ground. They're terrestrial hunters, hunting like the original raptors, the dinosaurs. Now, they'll go after small mammals and reptiles. They're fierce. They even go after venomous snakes like cobras and black mambas. That's one reason why we think that they might have gotten their name from the Arabic word for hunter bird. But when you see them today, you can just call them Stella and Charlie. You'll probably see them up on their legs, running around today. They are fascinating creatures. I really love spending time with them. We're going to pass by two more elephant habitats. Hopefully we'll catch a glimpse. I think I see an African elephant in the distance, in the habitat ahead of us. We'll see if we can catch a glimpse of her. That's probably going to be Shaba. She's our uh, oldest uh, African elephant. She's about 46 years old. Wow. Sometimes you can find her living with her friend Mary, who is the oldest elephant here. She's an Asian elephant. She just turned 58 years old in January, so her 59th birthday is just a few months away. 
Let's see if Shaba will walk into view. She's just hanging out behind those logs there. Chances are there's a nice puzzle feeder there with yummy food that she's working at right now, trying to get a nice tasty treat. There we go, we can kind of get a view of her if you look towards the back. Now all these big trees are called Utura trees. They're full of food, they're puzzles. So they have to use their brains, figure out how to get inside, also use the muscles in their trucks, which they can have up to 40,000 muscles there alone. That's more muscles than we have in our entire bodies. We must only have about 600 muscles total. That seems like we're not going to get the best view of Shaba. As I mentioned earlier, she's not going to move unless she wants to, and I think she's got a yummy food treat over there. So we're going to keep moving ahead and explore some more animals that live here. I love to come over to this part of the zoo. Right across from the elephants, we have Sabertooth Grill. If you're in the mood for Mexican food, that might be a good place to stop by. And the best part is, if you time it right, you might just have a lunch or dinner date with one of our elephants today. Then you can say hello to the camels that live on our right. Ah, we got a great view. These are dromedary camels. They're native to North Africa and the Middle East. And they're recognizable by that big hump on their back that is full of fat. That fat is their secret to survival. Up in the go for long periods of time without drinking water or having to eat food. Wow. Now they are native to the Africa, but we believe that they originated in the Americas because we found fossils over here. And that makes a lot of sense because they still have camels with cousins that live in this part of the world. Animals like llamas, alpacas, and quinacos. You can actually find some of them between the camels and the California condors. And if you look up to your right, you'll find the California condors in the tree. These birds are very special because they are nature's feed of crew, helping to keep our planet free of carcasses and disease. And back in the 1980s, they were at the brink of extinction. There's only 22 of them left in the entire planet. Thankfully, we partnered up with the Los Angeles Zoo the California Condor Recovery Program, and through our safari park, we were able to help boost those numbers in just 40 years, from 22 to almost 500. And about half of those birds now live out of the wild, having chicks of their own, helping to boost that species all across the Southwest. You might just see them flying up above you one day. They're spending time over here in California, maybe visit the Grand Canyon, or find yourself in Baja, Mexico. Here at the zoo, they live next to kangaroo stop number four, which is right at the end of Elephant Odyssey. You can follow me along on your maps. We're right around the bottom right corner. We're about to arrive at the home of the meerkats. Let's see if we can find them scuttling around the ground. They live in big family units known as mobs in intricate underground tunnel systems. And those tunnels and their numbers help to keep them safe because there are lots of animals who like to make them their next meal. And when they team up together, they can actually take down poisonous scorpions and even venomous snakes. You're going to find them living in areas of Africa like the Kalahari Desert. A lot of people are grateful to be their neighbors because they help to keep humans safe by keeping those numbers of poisonous animals down. You might see them uh, chirping to each other today, communicating. Communication is key when you're trying to survive on the savanna. They have a really distinct uh, form of communication. You might even say language. They're able to tell different threats apart and give specific directions to each other as well. This is the Kofi Rock. represents volcanic rocks in the center of Africa. It's a really unique habitat. For little animals, like this cliff spreader here. And they have very, very small feet. The tips of their hooves are about the same diameter as a dime. Now having those hooves that small, let them go jump up on those rocky cliff sides before becoming the female of your predators, like leopards that might be after that. And if you're a fan of leopards, you can find them down here in the hillside of Africa Rock. We got a lot of really cool animals to live over here find our leopards, you might see our homodryas baboons running around, you can find the honey badger somewhere down there as well, got a beautiful aviary and all the way at the bottom, you're going to find the lemurs and leopard sharks and penguins. And this is the Ethiopian highlands, that's where you're going to find animals like the gelato monkeys living. 
a lot of puppies actually grow there. Sometimes when we grow food for ourselves, we destroy wild spaces. But some farmers are growing food in a new way. It's called shade-grown crops. That practice leaves existing forests and jungles, and it actually makes for better food because they get to absorb all those nutrients and minerals that come from the wild. And that's an easy way we can be allies for wildlife at the grocery store. Just by being a conscious consumer, looking at what we're buying, where it comes from, and how it's made. Because we vote with our dollars, so that's a great way to tell companies they want their products, but not at the cost of the natural world. We're entering Sydney's Plaza. This represents the Australian Outback. And as you come around this corner, If you look to your right here, you can find our koalas. This is where our females live with their joeys, their little babies. We got Sydney's Grill on the left, my favorite place to eat it to do. And we're gonna make a little loop around the urban jungle, check out the wildlife they live here, and then we'll come back to the koala boys. Now right in the center of the urban jungle, you're gonna find our hippos. We got Kunani and Amashle that live over here. Looks like you can line up for giraffe feedings. That's going to start, I believe, right around 12 o'clock. When you hop off the bus, you can come back and purchase tickets for that. Feed our beautiful tower of giraffes. We have the side giraffes that live here at the zoo. I keep an eye out for the littlest ones. We have Eleanor and Mawe that live over here. Mawe will be the smallest giraffe. And she was just born last November, so her first birthday is just two months away. Now you might see our hippos in the center. As we go around the loop, we'll pass by another zebra, maybe some flamingos, porcupines, anteaters, cheetahs, and then we'll make it back to koalas. The rest of this zone is a quiet zone for me, so I'll be quiet on the microphone. I'll drive by nice and slow so you can enjoy the view, and I'll talk to you when we get back to koalas.
back to the front of the urban jungle. We got kangaroo stuff one on our right, our male koalas live in these trees to the left. Now these koalas are marsupials, that means they were raised in a pouch. Now they're males, so they don't have a pouch, but they started their life in one. Koalas are pregnant for about 35 days. Little baby koalas are born and they're about the size of a jelly bean. They'll travel up their mom's fur and into that little pouch. And we'll spend the next about six to seven months developing until they pop their head out one day and they're ready to start exploring the world. Now these little guys sleep throughout most of the day. Australia can be very, very hot. So they become accustomed to moving when the day's cool. They also spend all day munching on eucalyptus leaves, which are toxic plants, very fibrous and hard to digest. We'll spend their time eating, digesting, and sleeping. We're so grateful to have them here though. Koalas are amazing animals. They've been living at our zoo since 1925, so they've lived here for over 97 years. We've had lots of generations born and raised at our zoo. You can meet the newest generation in the trees to our left. Spending good quality time with their mamas. We're about to make our way across the Sydney's Plaza. We got our Boardwalk Beer Garden on the left. You can get ice cold beer there, maybe have lunch at Sydney's Grill. Got delicious burgers, ices, and margaritas. Then you get a gift for someone you love to remember the zoo. The best part about it is every dollar that is spent here goes right back to helping wildlife across the planet. So we're a nonprofit organization. We depend on business like yours today. That's what helps us to practice uh, wildlife. Uh, care innovations all across the planet, helping us to strive to create a world where all life can thrive. Now you still got some fun parts of the zoo to explore, some surprises for you today. If you go down the hill to your right, that's going to take you to Center Street. That's where you can find all of our beautiful bears. The road on your left is called Front Street, that connects Sydney Plaza to the Fun Plaza. Now it looks like we're gonna have to wait just a moment before we can pull into our unloading dock. When you hop off the bus, if you take a left, you'll make your way back to koalas. If you take a right, you're gonna make your way back to the front of the zoo. to explore the zoo. You made a good choice of hopping on nice and early in the day. So now you found out how to make the most of your day here. I want to thank you for spending your day here with us. We're arriving at our unloading dock, so take a look around your feet. Make sure you don't leave anything behind. When our buses are parked, I'll open up the bottom first and then the top. If you got any questions, feel free to stick around. I'll be happy to answer that. My name is Sergio. I was your driver today. Thanks for riding with me. Have a wonderful day here at the zoo. Hope to see you back here soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.